Welcome back. Um, my name again is Roger Berkowitz uh, from the Hannah Arendt Center at, at Bard College. And uh, after an amazing uh, kickoff to the conference um, uh, with David van Raybrook, uh, we're now going to continue with our second keynote talk by Elena Landemore. Um, Elena Landemore is, the, is an associate professor of political science at Yale. Um, she's written two books uh, that both uh, 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 are about what she would call democratic theory and the epistemology that relates to sortition. Uh, the first book was called Democratic Reason, which won the 2015 David and Elaine Spitz Prize for the best book in liberal or, and or democratic theory. Um, uh, and now a new book, which I just got yesterday. Uh, I think it just came out this week. Uh, Wednesday. Yep. What? Wednesday. Wednesday. So right hot off the presses, Open Democracy, Reinventing Popular Rule for the 21st Century. Um, so Elena is going to talk for about 20 minutes, and then uh, we'll have a brief uh, discussion with me and her and, and David. Uh, and then we will open it up again for questions. A reminder, if you want to ask questions, go to the participation button on the top of your webinar screen, and you can ask a question. Welcome, Elena. Elena. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Professor Berkowitz, for organizing this encounter. I'm, I'm uh, very excited to meet David Van Raybrook for the first time, whose work I've uh, long admired from afar. And uh, I wanted to report on this anecdote uh, from 2016, where his name came up in an interesting context. I was at the Philadelphia. I was in Philadelphia at the convention uh, for of the American Convention of Political Science. Uh, I was there for a panel on lotteries and the transformation of democratic theory, but two days earlier I had attended a much larger all-star panel the, where there was, among others, Jeremy Waldron. And the topic was putting back the political into political theory, five new works. For the life of me, I can't remember who, which books were talked about, but what I remember very clearly is that at the beginning of his speech, uh, Jeremy Waldron waved a book around and it was your book uh, did david it was uh, against elections and he was making fun of it as uh, you know uh, something a little bit too out there uh, and, uh, and the idea of a lottery based democracy as a uh, as unrealistic apolitical and highly manipulative um, as uh, jim fishkin's deliberative polls i remember that that was the, the gist of the of the commentary and for me, it really stuck with me because I thought it's not terribly surprising that the political theory establishment is making fun of lotteries. What's really key is that uh, when people start making fun of the idea, it means it's already uh, over. We already won in a way. The, the next st step is that they'll say they said it all along, you know? And so I thought that that for me was a really um, interesting um, um, moment. Um, and I should say that myself at the time, I wasn't quite where you were already. I wasn't quite ready to replace selected legislatures with randomly selected assemblies. Uh, but here we are a few years later, I've sort of uh, joined you in the, in the sortitionist camp fully. Uh, I call my own model open democracy and, and uh, as you saw, I just uh, have, a, have a book out on, on the topic. But rather than talk about my abstract theoretical model, I would like to talk about a very concrete example of, uh, of, a, of a randomly selected body that has helped me crystallize my belief in the capacity of ordinary citizens selected at random to occupy the role of actual lawmakers. So Iceland had already played uh, that role of, of um, key example in a way uh, in showing me that a constitution could actually be written by somewhat ordinary citizens on the basis of uh, the input of 950 randomly selected citizens. The problem is that every time I would bring up that example, I ran into objections that were quite predictable and, and have some merit, which is that, well, writing constitution after all, it's not that hard. You can always copy paste from other examples around the world. Uh, and second of all, Iceland uh, is a really nice example, but it's a country the size of a small town in the US and it's very homogeneous. So surely just because it works there doesn't prove it would work anywhere else, especially larger and more multicultural, multicultural countries. Uh, but as it turns out, in um, 2018, France uh, started the process of experimenting with uh, various uh, 
randomly selected bodies. So first in the context of the great national debate where uh, there were 21 uh, such uh, randomly um, selected assemblies that were convened to reflect about four general topics for about a day and a half each. And later, at the end of the great national debate, uh, one of the conclusions of the great national debate was to organize uh, a convention on climate change. Uh, and that's what uh, President Macron did by convening 150 randomly selected citizens to Paris uh, in the beautiful uh, Yena Palace for nine months, seven weekends, uh, to come up with solutions to very, very technical issues, uh, issue, uh, how to, um, uh, reduce green gas emissions by 40% uh, uh, of the 1990s levels by 2030 in a spirit of social justice. So, uh, so let me um, ask the question, right? Uh, did they succeed in answering that very technical question, right? Because so far, uh, the examples we have are of um, assemblies like the British um, Columbia Assembly, which had to offer a new electoral system uh, and succeeded, but in the end was disavowed in a referendum, in a way, uh, where people didn't follow them. We have the example of, of, the, of Iceland with the constitution, which also didn't work because the referendum uh, supported the outcome, but the parliament refused to turn the proposal into law. So what, what's going on with this French citizen uh, convention? So my uh, analysis is that the French citizens succeeded in uh, playing the role of quasi lawmakers, if you will. They were asked to come up with a, uh, ready to go proposals, ready to be translated into uh, regulation, uh, or at least be ready to be debated by parliamentarians or um, ready to be submitted to a referendum directly. That, that was the sort of presidential promise by President Macron. And I, I, I think that uh, they succeeded, but the, the second question that um, comes up then is that, given that they didn't quite succeed on their own, if you will, because they were very much helped by uh, experts, can we say that they basically created the law on their own or that they uh, had to avail themselves of experts and were perhaps captured by them and in fact had to surrender their sovereignty over the laws to these experts? That's uh, a typical objection that's raised uh, against the, the, the experiment. And my answer is, here is uh, yes, again, um, they managed to um, uh, do that on their own, but it uh, required very careful institutional design. Uh, it wasn't completely perfect. And if it were ever to be repeated, it would, uh, we would need to think about how to improve the, the design. So let me first make a um, short shrift of the demonstration that they were capable of writing uh, actual laws. I mean, not laws with a, with a legal status, because of course the constitution being what it is, you still need a, a, a process uh, through a, a official institutions to make to turn them into official laws, but the, the, the quality of the proposal was well law-like. And it's indeed probably the most spectacular achievement of this convention that 150 people who knew very little at the beginning of the process, the, the level of naivety of the questions during the first weekend was astounding. Uh, and I had only seven weekends to work on these questions as a group, managed to generate 149 high quality proposals by the end of a nine month process that was complicated by all kinds of social movements and a global pandemic. Because of course in, in March, uh, like everyone else, they had to move to Zoom meetings and it was extremely complicated uh, logistic wise. So their proposals are currently taken seriously by parliamentarians and experts alike and, and honor the citizens who produce them. Of course, there are people who crit criticize and deride the proposals, but these people would do the same to expert proposals or parliamentarian proposals. So it's nothing terribly surprising. So I think at this stage, very few people contest the fact that the 150 members of the Convention for Climate fulfill their task of, of playing quasi lawmakers. 
Again, what people who are or remain critical of the process now say, however, is that in the end, the citizens didn't do much. They blindly followed the experts selected for them and they didn't invent anything new. Uh, so I'd like to make the case that overall, neither claim are true, uh, though experts did overstep their role and did try to co-opt the process many times with some of the output being clearly influenced by their priorities and wishes. So I think that, yes, we can acknowledge some weaknesses, but on the whole, the citizens uh, managed to, to maintain their sovereignty of, the, of the, the, the proposal. And I think that it points to the kind of better design we could, we could imagine for these kind of flaws not to, not to materialize. And the idea is to keep experts on tap, not on top. They, they, they need to remain at the disposal of the citizens and not um, uh, uh, controlling them. Notice that uh, the, the letter that was uh, sort of giving a task to, to, the, to the citizens, the one that uh, the Prime Minister, uh, Edouard Philippe sent to the convention, explicitly mentioned the word co-construction. They wanted the citizens to co-construct the proposals with experts. But there was always in the, in the design a clear hierarchy in terms of who was going to be held responsible in the end and who had sovereignty over the text and it was to be the citizens. So they were supposed to have full ownership of the product. Uh, and in the end, I do think that the, the, this, these quasi laws are their baby, not the experts babies. So let me give you a sense of how that played out in the French convention, um, which in many ways went further than many uh, precedents in the way it embedded experts in the protocols. For example, if we, if we think of uh, Jim Fishkin's de deliberative polls, in them, experts intervene only as speakers who speak on specific panels, on specific issues, without mingling with the participants. In the regional assemblies of the great national debate, there were at most fact checkers, and that's it. In the Icelandic process, experts were consulted by the council members at will and intervened after the fact in rewriting some passages of the text produced by ordinary citizens including in damaging ways, actually. In the French convention, uh, something interesting happened. The traditional hierarchy was inverted by subordinating expert advice and knowledge to the ends defined by citizens. It required a transformation of both groups in their, in their habitus, especially, and uh, the, the creation of a relationship of trust and respect anchored in a clear sense that the citizens were the ones giving the directions and the experts were uh, simply there to help make this vision concrete. Again, it wasn't completely successful, but it gives a sense of the possible. So for those of you who are not familiar with the convention, maybe I should say a few words about how it came about and, and what it uh, looked like. So it started in late September 2019, and it's much more similar to the kind of single issue problem solving assembly implemented in British Columbia in 2004 or Ireland in 2018. Uh, there were 150 randomly selected citizens versus 161 in the British Columbia case, 99 in the Irish case, or 526 in the latest deliberative poll by, by Fishkin in Texas. Uh, I won't go into the organizing uh, details. So what interests me really here is the, the role played by experts in, in their relationship with the citizens, um, which was basically invented on the fly by uh, practitioners like uh, Res Publica and Mission Publique with the input of a specific uh, governance committee of 15 plus people who were, were in charge of designing the, 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 uh, the structure of this, of this process. Uh, so who are these experts? So they, they are individuals identified as bearers of a certain type of knowledge and expertise through their credentials, reputation, and who are selected as such to intervene in the convention. By contrast, the citizens are defined in this kind of experiments as non-experts in the sense that they are chosen on a random basis rather than whatever knowledge and expertise they happen to have. But notice that it doesn't mean there are no experts in the group because of course we ended up with an architect, uh, uh, you know, a mathematician, uh, people who, worked, uh, who, who were working in a construction business. Uh, so in fact, there was a lot of expertise just not selected as such which happened to be there by chance, so to speak. Um, so 
these experts fell into different groups. I identified about five of them, roughly. Uh, in First of all, you have the governance committee with 15 people, two co-presidents, one from a think tank, uh, the other a scientist. Then you had uh, three climate experts, three citizen participation experts, and five experts of the so-called so economic and social field, members of the CESE, our um, uh, third legislative chamber in France. You had also the experts of participatory democracy, you know, where the one is in charge of organizing the whole thing. Um, so dozens of individuals running a tight show on the basis of years of experiential knowledge of participatory debates. You had also researchers, 550 scientists or so from all academic fields. You had uh, groups of experts providing assistance to the citizens, so a logistic group uh, uh, who was a leg legalistic committee, a logistic group, I'm not exactly sure um, how to translate this in English. They were there to transcribe the proposals in legalese, basically. They were there to explain to the citizens what's already in the law, what can be translated into law, and, uh, and to formulate those proposals in, in the legal uh, jargon. And finally, a fifth group were consulting experts who intervened punctually in plenaries, in the working groups, uh, in the speed dating session that was organized between, um, between, uh, between the, the citizens and experts. Uh, and of those kind of consulting experts, you had two kinds, impartial experts and lobbying experts who worked for particular interest groups and corporations. All in all, in all for 150 citizens, you had about, probably about 160 experts mobilized to help that assembly. So it was a huge mobilization of expertise around those citizens. This makes it all the more important to make sure that citizens stay on top, right? And the experts on top. Why? Because, uh, and I'm trying, going to try to document that with some, some evidence. In my view, the great contribution of citizens is that they prevent the closure of the conversation and the limitation of the exploration of the, the epistemic landscape, if you will, to what is known and familiar. Uh, so I'm not gonna go into the theory of collective intelligence that, I, that I've developed elsewhere, but the idea is that indeed, uh, the citizens bring the diversity that ensures that we explore a lot more of the, of the uh, a solution set than, than experts do. The experts really, in, in, in this particular case, I could observe it in, 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 you know, in real time, do tend to stay in the safe box, um, whereas the citizens, through their naivete in some ways, their freshness of, of, uh, of vision, keep reopening the boxes. Uh, and the thing is, the fact that the, the, the citizens keep forcing the, the, the experts to reopen the box is actually good for the experts themselves. It, it was good for them to be forced to adapt and to de-ossify their knowledge. And in some ways, I saw that evolution over time. At the beginning, they came in with a certain um, expectation of difference very clearly. Um, you could see that at, at a sociological level in, in their body language, in the, their reaction to questions, in their you know, a uh, slight condescension in some cases. Uh, but on, over time, they adapted and, they, and there was a sort of a, a really nice way in which the, 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 the groups converged towards each other and, and created a, a real um, working relationship based on trust, I think. So let me show you a couple of examples of uh, the way citizens were capable of pushing back against uh, experts temptation to dictate answers. So the first most glaring example is actually on carbon tax. This was um, a solution that was pushed by many experts, including economists, because it's supposed to be the key to you know, everything concerning climate change. The price signal is so essential. Eventually, we'll have to do it, so let's do it. And they kept you know, uh, hammering that notion that the carbon tax, even though it had triggered the Yellow Vest movement earlier, had to um, happen in one, one way or another. It was rejected by the citizens because they sensed that the country wasn't ready. They sensed that um, there were other solutions that, sh that should be tried before, that um, uh, there was too much uh, polemic around it. So even though actually in, in, in polls, it turns out that there's a very slim majority, perhaps after all, not so opposed to it. Um, we never heard of it after the, the first few weekends, basically. But there was more subtle pushback uh, in, um, in, in, in plenaries as well that I observed that I thought were really beautiful. So I'll give you this example of 
two lawyers who come to expose uh, fr from the legalistic committee who come to the center of the of the amphitheater to lecture the citizens uh, with a very technical PowerPoint about the hierarchy of norms in French law. So uh, one is an activist for Greenpeace, uh, one is a state councillor. Uh, and the PowerPoint is extremely long and not to put to find a point on it, quite boring. Um, it's typed way too small, there's way too much information per slide. And as I look around, I see that very few people are taking notes, that some people are, you know, the head on their arms kind of falling asleep. Uh, it's, not, it's not looking too promising. And I quote myself zoning out at times, which is confirmed, by the way, my impression is confirmed the next day on mood boards where people, you know, say how they feel about the whole thing. And you have a lot of uh, complaints about how the expert's presentation was too technical, etc. Yet, to my surprise, when question time comes, the first question to the state councillor is this one. In the table of the hierarchy of norms, you did not place, you did not note the place of contracts. And I'm blown away at this moment by this very specific informed question. Uh, and I wonder how the state councillor is going to handle that curveball. So the answer is, I quote the state councillor, it was to enlighten you on what you are going to propose. A priori, you are not going to propose contracts. There are two types of contracts, private contracts and public contracts. But it's not in what you are a priori well, that said, yes, that's an excellent idea. Contracts are also part of what you could propose. Contracts between private persons on certain matters. You are right. Don't riddle yourselves. You are right. So you know the move from absolute self-assurance, if not downright arrogance, I, I'm, it was meant to enlighten you, then flatly denying the possibility of legislating about contracts, and then going into lecture mode, and then mid-sentence completely reversing herself um, and I think what happened is that she was jolted out of, of her normal trajectory and forced to confront a, another possibility, the possibility that citizens would actually legislate about private contracts. And because she's smart, she realized it and, and veered course and, and expanded her box to include that suggestion by a citizen. And maybe most of the others would, couldn't have you know, cared less or paid attention to this, but it's enough that there's one. It's enough that you have like one person in the group and statistically, the larger the group, the more likely you'll, you'll have somebody who cares about that specific issue and will notice it. Um, so another example of citizens pushing back and, and being able to keep control over the text is um, when uh, an expert tried to mention that the proposals uh, were going to cost too much money and that the president were never going to, was never going to implement the solutions if uh, it uh, made the French deficit go up to 10% of the GDP, you had a big pushback from the citizens who one of them said, uh, I understand we should pay attention to funding, but to focus on that now is a little too quick. We're going to think about it. We will find solutions. Do not rush us. Later, there was also a conflict of, uh, of sovereignty over text. One of the citizens realized that uh, 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 an advice by an expert had been inserted wholesale in the, in the text and complained about it. He said, no, 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 that's not from us, it's from them. It should be more or less in the margin of the text, not, not in, in over, um, taking over the original text. So they were very um, uh, territorial about uh, the, the, the work and, and very um, uh, eager to preserve the sovereignty over the text. So that's not to say that uh, a lot of interventions by experts didn't end up shaping the content. Uh, I think uh, Nicolas Hulot, the former Minister of Ecology, certainly had a huge influence on, on the, the demand for um, you know, a, right, uh, um, a recognition of the crime of ecocide or uh, such things. But I think basically the idea is that we should be able to, to build a design that's uh, foolproof, that's, um, I'm, not say, I'm gonna say expert proof, but that, that maintains them in the, in the right position. And, so one way um, this can be done is through the presence of impartial guarantors, which is a feature of the, of the regional assemblies in the great national debate and this convention on climate change. So you had uh, uh, impartial guarantors that amplified the voice of citizens. So for example, when expert, um, the expert PowerPoint failed to recognize the need, the, the possibility of a, a multiple uh, question referendum, a citizen coyly noticed it and mentioned it in the chat and the impartial guarantor is the one who said, look, why didn't the expert mention the possibility of a multiple choice referendum that uh, citizens could put their proposals to? 
uh, why is that not an option? And the expert said, well, because it's never been done in France, so we didn't think it was worth putting on the table. But the expert, the, the impartial guarantor was there to say, no, 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 it's, the, it's for the citizens to decide, not for the experts to rule out certain options. Um, so so I, I just wanted to basically give you in a very compressed amount of time, some examples of the ways in which you can design a, um, a, a citizen's assembly so that there are a lot of experts who bring a lot of evidence and content, but at the end it's, it's um, the citizens who are in control and formulate uh, the, 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 the proposal their own way uh, with their own words. Even if at the end there's a the legalistic translation, it's still validated by the citizens, verified by the citizens, sanctioned by the citizens. So there are tons of objections that you could bring to that that I'm happy to go into. For example, you could say, yes, but they don't speak legalese. So the asymmetry of, of power is still on the side um, of the experts. Uh, uh, you could say a lot of things, but I, I, I think I've um, already uh, gone over time. So I'm happy to tackle those objections in the Q&A if needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. Um, I, I want to remind everyone that you can ask questions uh, by going to the participation tab in the in the uh, in the webinar and and filling out the question form. And I'm going to try and bring as many of those in as I can uh, in this session and, and continuing throughout the day. Um, as a first question, um, let me see if I can pick on one area where I think you and, and David maybe disagree a little bit, or at least uh, our intention. Um, you mentioned the idea of collective intelligence, which you wrote about in your first book um, mm -hmm. on uh, democratic reason. And uh, you know, um, from that idea, there's sort of a, a sense that you develop that actually these kind of participatory democratic uh, practices um, led by experts uh, with the right procedures will actually lead to maybe better or more right decisions. And I think that's part of where you derive the legitimacy, not the whole way, but part of where you derive the legitimacy um, for, for citizen assemblies and, and sortition. And if <coughs> I understand it correctly, um, David maybe doesn't take that approach quite as much. So I thought I'd maybe ask you to spell out your argument for this collective right. intelligence and then let um, David maybe continue on and ask some questions either about that or something else, depending on how he wants. Uh, yes, so, so I don't think we're in disagreement. I think that it's just that um, I think David um, is committed to equality for equality's sake, whereas in fact, I, I provide some epistemic uh, foundations for it. I think that's what it comes down to. So you don't need to go down one level like I do. I just find that it's more convincing for me to have some, some, some epistemic support for the value of equality and, and the value of descriptive representation. And the value of descriptive representation is that you get the full cognitive diversity of the whole country in, in the mini public. And so, you know, I, I, it's this, if I want to boil down the insight uh, from my previous work, it's basically this. The whole, you know, 18th century, 19th century premise was that if you want a smart assembly, you staff it with smart people, a natural aristocracy of virtue and talents. I think what, what I want to say, um, alongside, you know, great minds, including uh, Aristotle and, and uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and, uh, you know, um, and, uh, you know, more recently people like uh, Scott Page, perhaps, I, I think that, no, it's about maximizing the, the, the cognitive diversity of the group rather than the average competence. Because you can have very, very smart people who think too much alike and they will take you to a dead end street. They would take you into a wall. That's what happened. It was very, very smart people at the top chose an eco tax that set the country on fire. Whereas if you had a random sample, they would have anticipated that. In fact, I'll tell you this. In June 2018, Ma Macron had already organized a, a, a 400 uh, randomly, mini pub randomly selected mini public on energy questions. One of the findings, one of the recommendations was to be very careful about the fiscal aspect of eco um, environmental policy because it could set, uh, it could really infuriate people. 
So basically, it was already there. And in January, when uh, Macron visited the, 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 the Convention on Climate Change, uh, he told them, I should have done this earlier. It would have saved me the troubles I ran into. So, so it does, it's, it's, to me, it's a, it's a verification of the prediction that, that um, a diverse group of ordinary citizens actually more likely to represent correctly the problems of the country and figure out the solutions uh, that work than a much more elitist, um, cognitively biased group, even barring the conflicts of interest that naturally arise when, when this group self reproduces over time. Um, so I think that um, that's the key argument that we need to move from a, from a mindset where we, where we think that we need to maximize the average competence of the members to a mindset where what we seek to maximize is the diversity of perspective that we bring to the table on a particular issue. Does that help? It does. Um, I could I could ask one quick follow up and then I'll, I'll let, which is that, you know, in, in, in democracy in America, Tocqueville says that the spirit of democracy comes out of the townships. Um, but he says that the spirit of democracy in the townships is always at odds with the civilizing uh, effects of sort of uh, a, a cosmopolitan, more elite driven um, government. And um, I, I guess I'm wondering is, it strikes me that one of the things I think you have to accept if you're going to move in this direction is local and even maybe national. I mean, take, you know, if you have nationalist movements, the idea that you may get some very illiberal ideas and I, and I, and I'm not saying that's bad or good, but it does strike me that, um, uh, at least as I understood it, David is saying, you know, we may, we may get ideas that are illiberal and, and quite passionate and, um, and, and, and ideas that a lot of people who are starting these things don't like. And I think I might've lost Elena. Um, uh, anyway, um, while I wait for her, hopefully to come back, uh, David, maybe you want to talk a little bit about this. I mean, do you see this as an issue between you and Elena? I knew you were going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I very, very much like her, her idea about cognitive diversity. Uh -huh. You may have a parliament with 150 brilliant lawyers. They still are going to know less than a, a random sample of 150 citizens. What they bring in, in terms of experience, lift experience, is, is priceless. What you get basically with deliberative democracy is you bring, you bring one country into one room. And it's hard. The hardest part in deliberative democracy is making people enter that room. But once they're inside, they become the biggest ambassadors of how you can do democracy differently. I've seen it time and again. I've seen how random citizens who did not want to, who didn't know what to, what to expect of all this, basically became very much involved and very thrilled by the experience. And for many people, it's a transformative experience to sit down with people you do not know, you do not know with whom you listen. A lot of our democracy today is talking about people with whom you never talk. Deliberative democracy is talking with people. Um, I like the idea of uh, Tocqueville. This is a, a part of him that I wasn't aware of. And I was very happy that Helen referred to W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, his plea for making sure, for increasing diversity into your representative organ. Um, we're still waiting for Helen. I think she might have dropped out of battery power. She mentioned something before. Yeah, I hope I'm hoping she, she, has, she has a charger somewhere. Uh, it feels it's a very difficult task for me to, to be Helen Landemore at this very moment. <laughs> um, but I don't, honestly, I don't see any fundamental distinction between the two of us. The question I was going to ask her, um, was like, what convinced you to delve into the topic of deliberative democracy? What changed your mind? Oh, there she is. Ellen, you're back. I am so sorry. I had a small, um, yeah, small technical. I Not tried to replace you. Very hard task. <laughs> so um, maybe I just, 
well, David, you were about to ask, you were about to say the question you had for. Elena. Helen, I mean, one of the questions I would uh, like to ask you is you, in the very beginning of your talk, you said like uh, it took a while before I joined the sorticianist camp. That sounded much more tribal than I <laughs> live with. But uh, what made you change your mind? That is my question. What convinced you that this is an interesting avenue of research or exploration? So uh, it's, it's not that I wasn't uh, convinced. I was just not sure what these uh, randomly selected assemblies were for. So if you want the, the, the purely um, theoretical argument that I just laid out before I, I got cut off, convinced me that, you know, given the, uh, there's a piece of the argument that I didn't quite um, mention, but it's, it's about the uncertainty of, of political issues, right? That we never know what problems are gonna be on the table. So it's impossible to engineer ex ante the, the kind of diversity you need. So, so if you don't know what kind of diversity you need, then you need to, to, to maximize it by default by reproducing the, the, the larger group in the small assembly. Yeah. Right? That, that's the most rational uh, sort of uh, calculation to, to make rather than take just, I don't know, economists and, and uh, uh, environmentalists. You, you just make sure you have a little bit of everyone in your group, a little bit of, uh, you know, student representatives, uh, uh, retired people, uh, vegetarians, you, you just, you, that way, whatever comes your way, you're prepared. You'll have someone in the room who knows something about the issue. Mm. You're more likely to, to generate good solution that way. Mm. Uh, but I thought, well, that probably means that um, randomly selected assemblies are, are good at generating uh, proposals about the direction the country should take doesn't mean they're good at uh, generating actual laws, which seems like a really difficult, specific, technical thing to do. So I, I was of that mindset that, okay, they're there to set an agenda. They're there at the beginning and, and maybe at the end, but in the middle, you still kind of need the, the lawyers, the, the experts. The, but, but then what happened is that Iceland happened and then the French uh, Convention on Climate Change happened. And, and now I actually think that if you give them enough time and you set the design right, and you have, of course, experts involved in this, in this subordinated function and position, um, then they're actually capable of, of ruling in, in the original sense, that is in, in legislating, they're capable of legislating for themselves and for the country, which is, which is not something that I, I was convinced of initially. And, and, and the more now? Sorry? Do you trust the citizens more now? Uh, well, I trusted them. I just didn't know that, that, that this was something that uh, could be done. You know, I didn't know how much time it would take, uh, whether they wouldn't be indeed co-opted by the, by the experts or, or captured by the experts. Or um, in fact, I've, indeed, I've, I've seen it that, that they, they do not, once they're empowered, once they're, once they're told, you're the ones in charge, they don't let go. As you saw in the French Convention, they, they decided to even create their own assembly, uh, their own associations, um, uh, the association of the 150, as they call themselves. They have their own logo, they have a Twitter account, uh, they meet regularly. Uh, why, why, why did, they, why did they do that? Because they knew that their, their legitimacy was uh, relatively weak. They knew that the president had... Uh, committed to submitting without filter the proposals to the parliament or to a referendum or to direct regulation, but they didn't entirely trust the, the system. And, and I think they were right, actually, because as we see now, um, it's, it's, it's not clear that uh, many of our proposals will actually be implemented. The parliamentarians are, are you know, uh, offering veto after veto and, and, and diluting the, the, the meaning or the, Mm -hmm. scope of their, their proposals so so they were right in a way so and and are, they are right in 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 fearing the, the 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 dilution of their proposals do they have any impact now are they there to remind politicians like hang on folks this is what we decided yes but i i think that there are two issues one is that as long as they are not given um uh, legal status, you know, uh, sort of, yeah, constitution, constitutional status, like the, as long as they're not given that kind of legitimacy, it's going to be very easy for official actors, 
uh, in the French system to ignore them. So, and, and I have a question, if, if I can, Roger, because I'm, yeah. I'm fascinated by, by it. I have two more questions. Uh, now, th this group that goes on beyond the original intention, they, they go on, on because they, their own initiative. Uh, are they st still being seen by the average Frenchman and French woman? Are they still seen as part of them or have they transformed into a sort of new expert lobby? Ah, that's a very good question. I, I think that um, the association of the 150 has transformed into a new kind of lobby in a way, uh, their own lobby. That, that I, I haven't really developed any clear thoughts about the legitimacy as such. I, I'm not sure it's uh, what they should have turned into. I, I, I have some doubts about, because you know they're completely self-selected at this point. It's some yeah. natural leaders in the group who decided to create that group to turn into uh, co-presidents. And, yeah. and so it's an old logic of um, political egos taking over. So it's no yeah. longer logic of sortition at all. And so I'm, I'm not entirely sure this, this was the right thing to do, but I, I understand the impulse and and there is some, some value in what they're doing, but yeah. to me, it's separate separate job than the job they were asked to perform in the yeah. citizen assembly. And then my, my last question: uh, What was your role throughout the French uh, Citizens Convention on the Climate? Did you have any particular role in the organization, or were you there no, mostly as an observer? No, I, I was there essentially as an observer. I was just there as a researcher. We were about, uh, I think, thirty to fifty researchers who. Uh, some of them being there all the time to document the the process. And then, well, one more question. And now you have now you have been observing. You've been seeing as citizens what they recommended was valuable, but there is no institutional plug-in to make sure that what they recommend is going to be taken care of. Uh, what would you recommend to uh, French President Macron to make sure that it doesn't just depend on his goodwill or the goodwill of his administration? Ah, it's a very good question. Well, so you know that uh, we're, we are, um, the, the parliament is uh, considering turning the, the third legislative chamber, the TESE, the Council uh, for Social and Environmental... Uh, uh, and Economic uh, Council. Yes, exactly. Uh, the third parliament of France. Yes, in two, in two, initially it was meant to be sort of like replaced by uh, um, a chamber of popular participation. Now it's been watered down into uh, a chamber of convention. And so the same old actors of organized uh, civil society, you know, um, representatives of uh, NGOs, unions, uh, students associations, all kinds of groups like that, will be in charge of regularly organizing conventions like the climate uh, convention. But to me, it's it's a very bizarre hybrid solution because in a, in a way it's um, subordinating citizens to existing organized associations in society that are represented in this third legislative assembly. And so I'm not sure it's going to empower citizens as much as, uh, mm. as one would want. So, so it's perhaps a beginning and, and in terms of going from here to, to a, a more lotocratic sort of a regime, it's perhaps better than nothing, but it might also just bury uh, the voice of citizens in the end. So I'm mm. not sure what I, I, I think we need more experiments of that type. So I would encourage Macron uh, to do more of those. So we learn more about what works and what doesn't. And, uh, and ultimately think really hard about ways to redistribute power between existing institutions mm. and this new one. Because the I problem the is- Sorry, I interrupted you. I do apologize. No, I, I meant to say that the temptation is to add another chamber to the existing chamber. So we already, we already have three. So we could just turn the third one into a more randomly mm. selected chamber, or we could add a fourth one that would be purely randomly selected. But at the end, you're just going to create more veto points and more confusion and more paralysis. So I think it would be more courageous to face the reality that we need to distribute power better among existing entities and, and, and perhaps uh, perhaps uh, replace some with, with this new kind of chamber. Yeah. Final question, is my impression right that Macron himself is ready, but that his government and parliament are less? 
Oh, well, I'm not uh, that close to power to be able to tell you this. Uh, my sense is that uh, indeed some of the ideas seem to come from him and uh, it's not clear that they are shared in his immediate um, vicinity. I, I was especially struck by the body language of Edouard Philippe, the prime minister, when he came to talk to the Citizen Convention on Climate Change. He, he said, you represent France in all its diversity. And as he was saying that, his whole body was like, literally denying it. He, he believes in representative, demo at, at the time, I think he's evolved actually on the matter. I think he, he probably was somewhat convinced or, or pretended to be convinced, but at the beginning, he and a lot of people in the in the government, I think thought this was just a distraction and, and that they didn't believe in, in um, a representation of that kind. So I yeah. think it's changing slowly, but it's changing. Okay, good, thank you. Thanks. So there's a, a number of questions that go specifically to the French climate convention model. So I, I think I'll try and group some of them together. I mean, one, there's just a curiosity out there. Um, what were the results? Uh, you know, what was the big takeaway? Uh, you know, you had said that they resisted carbon tax. Um, what would what did they propose? There's there's some interest in that. Um, and there's a lot of questions about what you and you guys were just debating about uh, how is Macron and the French government receiving the recommendation and um, will they lose their critical edge uh, as they do so? Um, and, and then there's the question of who sets the topic. So you, you said that the topic was, you know, how do we reduce carbon emissions 40% by 2030 in the spirit of social justice? Somebody set that. Do the citizens have a chance to revise that or not? And and so maybe talk a little bit about the actual convention, what they did, and maybe even just yeah, start there. So so um, the proposal that came out um, were very very diverse. So, you know they, they worked in four subgroups on housing, uh, production, consumption, uh, uh, transportation, and so. They try to cover all the the the, the sources of, of green gas emission. Really. So among the proposals, you had a, a mandatory uh, retrofitting of uh, housing by a certain date, so that it's uh, energy efficient, uh, which was kind of coercive in a way. I mean, it's meant to really uh, force everyone in France to insulate their uh, lodging correctly and uh, and make sure it's not uh, you know. Uh, 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 thermically irresponsible, if you will. Uh, and that was a huge source of debate in the convention between people who thought that this was too coercive and people uh, who thought that, uh, it, you know, we didn't have a choice at this point if, if the goal is indeed to cut uh, uh, green gas emissions by 40% by 2030, there was no choice. You need to move forward and be really uh, uh, even punitive in some way. So that was one, one big uh, outcome. Another outcome um, was, uh, for example, uh, uh, banning advertisement on certain products like uh, SUVs, uh, um, forbidding, uh, there was a lot of, you know, uh, sort of uh, indeed uh, restrictive proposals. So for example, if you can take a train uh, instead of a plane, then uh, certain, uh, flights should not be allowed to continue uh, if it's under four hours or under two hours. Uh, you had also the proposal of, a, of a, uh, the creation of a, a crime of ecocide, a recognition of a crime of ecocide in the constitution, modification of the of the French constitution to specify that it's a, a, a republic committed to the environment, uh, perhaps even over and above the economy. So a number a number of proposals like that. They considered putting them to a referendum. Actually, that was an option that they, they, they thought about. In the end, uh, they chose not to put many proposals to a referendum. They, they chose to do that for the, the crime of ecocide, but not for, for example, the, the obligation to renovate one's housing. Uh, so these are some of the examples of the, of the proposals that came out. Um, it turns out, as I said, there was a poll done in June that measured the, the distance between these proposals and the, the preferences of the French people. And they were not that far apart. Uh, a lot of people are actually 
at least at an abstract level and, and when it's just an idea as opposed to a, a, an imminent threat, if you will, uh, in favor of, of mandatory renovation, for example. Um, so it, it was not um, as extremist as some people predicted. They, they are, and, and also, even when it was uh, a little bit coercive and, and you know, making mandatory certain things, they always thought of a way to accompany people who didn't have the money to pay for renovations with, uh, um, uh, you know, certain type of loans, uh, making banks, uh, you know, help uh, help uh, the most vulnerable, giving some some helps uh, proportional to income, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they had all kinds of, of proposals, very custom tailored, very detailed. Um, you have to remind me of the other questions. The other, the other question was, um, and, and, that, and this will really go to both of you then in a way, um, in specifically in the French case, how, you know, what, what can be done or should be done or is being done, I guess all three, to actually make these recommendations have teeth or or power and not lose their critical edge, and and so I guess on a general basis, what I'm going to ask both of you is, you know, both of you have been involved in in a number of these um, assemblies and sortition uh, events and models. Um, what's your sort of ideal and slash practical system? What's the best way to you know, we, we, what kind of power should they have? Is it just a recommendation power? You know, Davi, you said something about, you know, one one body staying on and, and agitating in the future. If you were to recommend a policy, you know, where do they go? Are they legislators? Are they recommenders? How do you see it working? What so we I see now is that Deliberative democracy has been researched for almost 30 years and 40 years, and especially the last 20 years have been critical. And the metaphor for me, it's like it's like a muscle, like, like, a, like an organic muscle, like a biceps muscle. We know it's functioning. I mean, and the French experience, and I'm grateful to listen to Hélène uh, detailing how things happen. It's wonderful to hear. We know that the system as such uh, happens, but the tendons connecting that muscle to the political skeleton is, is still lacking. And it's still very much dependent on the goodwill or the interest of a person like Emmanuel Macron or uh, a specific mandate, a short-term mandate for a single topic, uh, uh, citizen assembly uh, to make to give this teeth to make sure that the muscle is attached and permanently attached to the political skeleton of the state. I think we will need more than that, and therefore I believe institutionalizing is an important step and making sure, for instance, well, who sets the agenda is one big task. In France, it was the government saying what should we do in order to reduce. Um, I know you now in, in Wallonia and in Brussels, citizens can bring up topics themselves with a certain limited amount of signatures. They can call for a citizens assembly. I think that's a very important political step. That's If this is the muscle, this is the one side of the muscle. This is the muscle that comes from the citizens asking a question, forcing the political system to hold a citizens assembly. Now, the second tendon is the tendon connecting the, the muscle back into the political system. And that, for me, is still a weak spot in many of the experiments that I know. We know now that these things work. We do not know how to make sure that they have political traction. And uh, the best way to organize this is making sure that your citizens keep on being involved after the job. Uh, and I, I fully understand, like Helene, I understand why, I mean, these guys in French, they have been doing a terrific job and they see the big risk of losing all this because when they go home, when they go back to the Perigord or the Pyrenees or whatever, uh, there's, there's no guarantee apart from Macron that this is going to be taking, taking up. So uh, somehow forcing political, the people in power to react, not just the day when they get the recommendations like Macron did, but make sure that two months later, four months later, one year later, there is an ongoing dialogue that is as visible, as mediatized, as uh, public 
as uh, all the promises they have hold before seems to be quite essential. And so this, I, I was... going back to the question of accountability, I mean, this is where the accountability is. I mean, it's, it's so easy to ask citizens for advice. It's much harder to turn this advice into law. Right, so, so I would be in favor of giving them legislative power over certain, uh, a, over a limited jurisdiction for a while. So maybe long-term issues or environmental issues or something like that. Um, in France, we, I, I was part of a group that pushed for a, an assembly of the future, you know, that would be focused on long-term issues like that. But um, I, I, I agree with David. I mean, I think it, you have to rethink the whole ecology of decision-making in, in our democracies to make them a lot more responsive to citizens and not just through uh, randomly based uh, assemblies. I think you also need to include participation rights like uh, citizens initiatives, uh, citizens right of referral, um, uh, uh, referendum initiated by citizens, uh, you know, so that you basically, because I mean, part of me is not surprised nor completely um, disappointed that that maybe the impact of this assembly is not as big as as, as uh, they hoped it would be because after all it's the first time we're doing this mm. it wasn't perfect uh, it has not much legitimacy it has a uh, uh, you know support from the population but after all it's it's a it's a first time and and so we just need to create um, more experiments like that at the local level turn it into something that's well known, well appreciated, has a lot of legitimacy uh, and, and, and get institutionalized. And, and, and I think that's how, how we're going, going to solve it yeah. in, on the term. I, Helena, this is, uh, if, if, I, if I can, uh, Roger. Yes. It's, you're right, it's the first time this needs to grow. At the same time, the climate challenge doesn't have that much time anymore. How do you reconcile these? Ah, so but that so that's a different issue, right? Which is I, I wouldn't um, put on the shoulders of uh, citizens' assemblies the whole responsibility of of solving. I mean, you know, of, of uh, I would I would keep those things apart. There's there's one thing. There's we, do we want to democratize our democracies, right? And I think citizens' assemblies are the right way to go, um, among other things like these more direct forms of participation I just mentioned. And this will necessarily take time and, 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 and uh, we need more, some more experiments to do it well. Then there's the other question of climate change. And that is perhaps indeed very urgent. Um, and, and what do we do about that? And that honestly, I, I do not have an answer. Um, there are a number of questions that we might talk about going to the nuts and bolts. Um, how much time? Should one of these, you know, this met for, I think you said seven months on weekends. Uh, is that right? Um, how much time is needed? That's, you know, is that too much time? You know, it's asking a lot of people. Uh, how big they should be uh, is another question. Um, and, and, and a bit about uh, who the facilitators are. I think there's desire for people to know more about um, uh, on these questions. So maybe, um, and then you can say a little bit about that. And if David, you want to add something, you can. Well, so I, I think that um, again, I wish we 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 had more uh, uh, evidence to support claims. But I, 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 my suspicion is that they could be larger, um, as large as parliaments. Mm -hmm. They would be in in, uh, in representativeness if they were larger. Um, they would cost a lot more, of course, but I think democracy costs money. And when you think that the French, uh, not the French, the American uh, presidential election is going to cost two billions, with very little gain of knowledge for anyone who's watching this, this show, why don't we invest in democratic infrastructures? Why don't we have like really large assemblies? Why don't we have staff? Why don't we have buildings? Why don't we encourage uh, architects, to, architects to, to think about a democratic design? For, for this kind of assembly, because one thing I didn't talk about, which, which is very interesting, is that the Yena Palace was not ideal in many ways. You know, it's really designed for people who are, um, you know, uh, far and few and, and don't speak too loud, and, and and it's not it's not really designed for the rambunctiousness of this kind of meeting. So, so we could reimagine with a co you know comfortable budget, uh, new 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 buildings uh, for large assemblies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, 
and uh, yes, I lost my uh, thread of thought. Oh yeah, what, what size and how long? Uh, what size and how long? So how long? Uh, I think that if we institutionalize them and we give them real legislative power, they should be in power for a year or more. Uh, and, and potentially for some questions, they could be there for just a few weekends or just a few weeks or just a few days. Um, it also depends on, on whether we give them a salary to, to, to perform their, their, their task and whether they come on during the, the week as opposed to the weekends, because in the case of the Convention on, on, on Climate, these people had jobs uh, and they quit their job on, on Friday morning to be able to, to spend three days in Paris, but it was very taxing of their family life, of their health, of all kinds of things. And I don't know that you can keep asking that uh, of people. I think they, they should meet during the week and um, there should be some kind of discussion about how uh, employers could accommodate people, like they accommodate people when they are on jury, uh, jury duty. So we, we'd have to rethink a lot of things, the relationship to the private sector. Um, uh, and there, there's, I think there's a lot of unknown, but the key is to, the key is to, to, to keep trying and experimenting and, and, and I think we'll figure it out eventually. Do they get money in France? Yes, they get paid. Um, How much? I think it's, I, I might be saying something wrong, but I think it was 80 euros a day, something like that. In German speaking Belgium, it's about 120 euros a day. Yeah. Um, I have um, a few questions that go to power in some way. Um, one is uh, uh, um, someone writes, uh, this is uh, Ria von Hoyek, uh, the 2% control things. Can we expect citizen? assemblies um, to actually uh, be able to uh, change things, to challenge that power. Um, an another related question uh, is that um, in, at least in the United States, and I think in many Western governments, although I'll, I'll, I'll speak for the United States because um, I, I, this is something I've worked on, increasingly uh, our, our parliaments and uh, Congress and legislative bodies have ceded their lawmaking authority largely to administrative agencies. Um, and this has happened for a whole lot of reasons. Um, and so I think the question here someone asks is, you can pass all the laws you want, but uh, if you don't control the administrative agencies, uh, you know, those, those laws will be diluted and, and changed in administration. Uh, how do you uh, address and deal with that power? Um, there's another one, but I'll, I'll stop with those two and then ask the next one separately. Um, what do you guys, Elena, Elena, what do you think of, of, of the 2% and the administrative uh, question? So I didn't understand the 2% reference. Oh, the 2% is the, the, the wealthy control things. Uh, ah. and, and you can have all these citizen assemblies you want but how are they actually going to, to break through that control? Well, uh, the 2% control uh, outcomes in part because they control parties in a system where um, you don't depend on, on, on a party to become a, you know, assigned to a randomly selected assembly, then, then that link gets broken. So maybe one year will be sort of uh, channeled into other directions and maybe there will be a, an attempt to buy the, the, the you know, the, the jurors, I mean, the, the members of, of those conventions, but as, as David said before, it's much harder to corrupt uh, in retail fashion, if you will, buying one person at a time than, than in, in bulk as in the party uh, system. So, so I think that would be already, um, uh, a way to break that uh, that grip of, of money on politics, uh, which is, I think, in part, in part linked to the electoral system. Um, and the other question was about... Um, administrative, the, the, the importance of the administration of the administrative state. Yeah, well, apparently, at least in France, I'm not sure about, about the US, of course, but in France, there's a demand on the part of some administrations uh, to include some um, randomly selected groups of citizens to help them figure out how to 
uh, deliver better better service to 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 the citizens basically so i think that there's a way even administrations could could figure out a way to collaborate with this kind of uh, mini publics uh, and i think it would be beneficial for both sides my my contacts with civil servants are, are very positive they love it because very often they prepare bills on the base of their expertise they have built for over years and then one day before the vote they see how a good bill has been watered down or overrun through party political logic uh, i think they, they they welcome the possibility of rational discussion even with lay people who might be more open to uh, long-term rational decision making than uh, electoral political dynamics so I don't see a big, a big conflict between the power of administrations and the power of citizens assemblies on the country. There's can a, I, go back, can yeah. I go back to one question that I feel was really important that I didn't get to address actually the question about do they get do the assemblies get to define their own um, their own questions and can they revisit the question? No, they don't. But I think that's actually key, in fact, because you you know it could be that the question that was asked of them was the wrong one. Uh, and they had zero control over that. And in fact, they, they, they have very little control about a number of parameters that I think they should have more control on. For example, I didn't get a chance to talk a lot about the governance committee of this um, assembly in France. It was 15 people um, appointed by government, more or less, uh, uh, or, or at least the, 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 the people who are in charge of organizing it. And... Uh, they decided to include two of the randomly selected citizens um, at their meetings to get their perspective. But it's true that it's basically um, a democratic body that's piloted or governed in a non-democratic way by those by those people who bridge the, the 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 assembly and the government. And I think there are a lot of issues with that sort of approach. And in in theory. Um, I think the you know if you go back to the ancient model, the boulet was not piloted by uh, by anyone. It was sort of like self-ruling that way, and so it was choosing the topics it wanted to legislate about or make pro law proposals about. And I think that that as if we can get to that, the closer we can get to that ideal of of a more autonomous uh, mini public, the better. But right now, it's it's very much you know. Uh, constrained and shaped and and uh, and uh, controlled by existing institutions so it, it will always be easy to marginalize if it's if it's kept in this position in, in the german speaking part of belgium the agenda setting power is specifically given to the citizens council they master the the, 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 the two tendons of the muscle they ask the questions and they take the answers to parliament. And I think it's essential. It gives much more autonomy than when the question comes from politics themselves. Um, there was another series of questions around things like what happens if there's a kind of nationalist or maybe even quasi totalitarian movement in a, in a country and, and, uh, this takes over uh, a citizen's assembly. Are there, where does the role of constitutionalism or limits come in? Um, you know, I mean, technically, again, in the United States, some of these questions I think are related, but I think also in Europe, there are, there are constitutional limitations on what the democracy can do in the Supreme Court, things like that. Um, how, do you, how do you protect, uh, you know, from a kind of, nationalist or, 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 or kind of populist movement. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this comes back to the question that I was asking Elena before when you, you had your, your, your signal dropped about Tocqueville, right? Um, uh, you know, Tocqueville says that democracy, the, the spirit of democracy comes out of the townships, but it's often uncivilized and very rough and, and quite prejudiced. Uh, and it needs, and it, and it's in conflict with the civilizing uh, role of sort of elites on a on a larger level, and and so I guess wondering how you guys see this conflict between the potential for a a a, a, a populist 
um, prejudicial uh, ideas emerging from, from these bodies, especially on a smaller level, but even maybe on a national level? Um, yes, so I mean, if you, if you have a descriptive sample, it will have exactly the number of white supremacists that there is in the population in proportion to you know the size of the assembly. So you'll have those people. Uh, but the thing is that if the group is large enough, uh, there should be enough of a debate of uh, of ideas that um, you know they 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 don't control the assembly. I think that I, I in one article I I calculated that the the odds of uh, even of a, of a, of a large uh, group like that taking over was really, really small. And so not particularly worried about that happening. Um, I think the, 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 the virtues of deliberation is that you can also ignore this kind of, uh, this kind of arguments if they're not good, uh, if they're not uh, uh, convincing. In, in, the 12, in the movie 12 Angry Men, the, the jurors after a while turned, them back, turned their back on the racist uh, juror. So I think there's, a, there's of course a limit to what you can listen to but at least up to a point you should you should let those people voice their their perspectives they might just be mistaken or or uh, or angry and 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 maybe just the, the, the opportunity to vent and say what they have to say might just might just do the trick and they might be able to move on and into a more constructive phase of the conversation i think that's that's the hope at least and then of course constitutions uh and, and constitutional limits are still very much a part of a of, of, of the vision for, for, for an open democracy of the kind that I have in mind, or, or I'm sure the, the, the kind that David has in mind. It's just mm -hmm. that instead of running to judges first, I think both David and I would like uh, us to trust our fellow citizens more and trust that you don't need to mm, put a muzzle on them, uh, that you can listen to them a bit more, that we can just expand and open the scope of democratic politics more before we... Uh, start telling people what they can't and can't say and, and, and what they can and can't think. That's, that's the idea. I fully agree. Uh, there is this argument saying that, well, so many people are so angry, so let's keep them out. Let's make sure that they do not become uh, participants in the deliberative process. I think that's the worst possible idea. It's precisely because people are angry that you sh should invite them. Uh, and make sure they become part of, of, the, of the dialogue. It's, uh, there is this idea like, oh, if, if, if you get the mob in, it's the beginning of fascism. Now, anger is anger. Uh, and many people who are nationalist or populist, they are not fascist yet. They may become fascist, and that depends to the extent they are being ignored and continue to being ignored. So anger is not something to, to be avoided. For me, the populist anger, it's, it's a gift. It's a gift wrapped in barbed wire, but it's still a gift. So you can run away from the barbed wire, or you can say like, well, let us try to create a space where we can unwrap and see what's behind this anger and take this anger very seriously. And I think in the long run, that might be more beneficial for a healthy democracy than ignoring those who are angry and mad right now. In the German-speaking part of Belgium, sorry to come back to that example, but it's the one I know best, uh, the, the bill making uh, this possible it clearly says that everything should be within the, the confines of the Belgian constitution and of the international treaties that Belgium has signed. So that gives the framework within which people can work. Um, yeah. I, I, the death, death penalty, for instance, is, is legally forbidden in Belgium and could not be introduced through such a procedure. I just want to second something that you just said, David, and, and I think that Elena said earlier as well. To me, one of the most important and exciting parts of, of this process is the educational process in how to be a self-governing citizen. Um, you know, Tocqueville says that the most important institution in American democracy is the jury system because it actually is the only system where people are forced to come together in small groups and talk about what they believe is right and wrong together. And it creates a sense of responsibility. And when RN says that the great failing of the constitution is that it created no little institutions, no, 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 no institutions for public deliberation. Mm -hmm. In many ways, that's what was lacking. And, mm -hmm. and I think, uh, you know, you guys have both expressed this very importantly and in and, and ways that matter. The last question I want to ask you to a number of people 
have asked, you know, well, the Greeks picked the whole bouye through this, their leaders. Um, uh, so some people are, there's, 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 the questions come up on different sides. Some people say, well, why aren't we picking our president or our, uh. on, a, on, a on a rotating basis? Why aren't we picking this? Why, why aren't you guys proposing to replace the elected representatives with lottery based representatives? Other people are saying, well, you know, cons you know, the consent argument, we want to be able to choose. I want to be able to choose who we represent. So, you know, interestingly enough, we had a debate last night, the Bard Debate Union, which we work with every year. We had two students debating a resolution, should we use sortition? And they took the basic position, either all or nothing. The sortition should either pick all the representative of the government or not. And they had their argument that way, but they recognized that you don't have to go full in. It seems to me both of you sort of embrace what we might call hybrid or partial sortition proposals, not to replace the representative consent driven government, but to add layers to them. Is that right? And why? Uh, Elena, are you there? I think we might have frozen. Will I answer while she reconnects? Yeah, why don't you answer while she's frozen? I. I do not want to live in a country that would turn overnight into a purely lottery-based democracy. But I don't want to live in a country either where um, no you... innovation is being tried. Helena, you, you dropped out for a while, Helen. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know what happened. I'm still here. All right, I'll just finish my remark and then I, I leave the floor to yeah, you. Yeah, sure, sure, sorry. Uh, so it's not a question of uh, either or. It's not about 0% or 100%. Uh, I believe that incremental change, gradual transformation of our democracy is needed. I do not know what the end point can be. Uh, are elections as such necessary or not? It might very well be that in 100 years we'll think differently. But for the next 40, 50, 80 years, I would love to see the electoral system enriched by a, a, a form of lottery and, and sortition, yes. Great, thank you. Elena, you wanna give a, get the final word here on this question? Sorry, so, so I think I, I would distinguish my, my sort of work at the, you know, in theory, in pure theory, I would say, where actually I'm in favor of replacing um, uh, elected representatives uh, with lotocratic ones for the legislative function for all the reasons I already adduced and because I don't think it's necessarily um, good to multiply uh, competing uh, sources of decision making on this. But of course, um, first of all, even at the theoretical level, I don't think an executive uh, should be chosen by lottery because it's just uh, one or a few people and, and uh, the function that they fulfill are, are probably not um, uh, well fulfilled by randomly selected people, and there, there are a lot more risks, of course, if you choose just one or a few people. You don't, you, you have zero safety there. Uh, you don't have the safety of the law of large number, if you will. Mm. And then, uh, in terms of uh, policy recommendations, of course, I, I don't believe in revolutions. I don't think we can abolish uh, the you know elected uh, houses overnight like that. So. But so on that level, I would just advocate for um, a careful redistribution of powers from one assembly to the next. And I think that uh, there are some prerogatives of currently elected assembly that could be given to uh, a randomly elected one mm -hmm. so that they do different things in complementary ways. In terms of uh, executive power, you could make a combination of both. You could have a uh, select committee the, the one that selects presidential candidates after which the vote takes place. I mean, in, in theory, you could make a random sample of 500 Americans who are going to nominate four people running for president, and that is open for election afterwards. I mean, you could combine both and would be great for legitimacy and, and competence. Interesting. So I haven't given much thought to the executive function because for me, it's supposed to be an executive function and it should be subordinated to the legislative. But there's a, one model that I like more than others, which is the Swiss model, where they have seven executives, not just one. Uh, that way you, you prevent a little bit the, the cult of personality that you observe in the US or in France. And so the, we, we, we move away from that sort of monarchical figure 
of the president? Well, um, we're at that time where I want to thank uh, David Van Raybrook and Elena Landemore. Um, this has been fascinating. Uh, we're about halfway through with today's webinar. Um, and uh, thank you both very much for being with us. I, I think you're both gonna stay with us for the breakout sessions coming up later. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, thank you. We're gonna take a 10 minute break and reconvene at one o'clock with Peter McLeod. Um, thank you very much.